Hello friends, it's Kayla. I'm so excited to kick off today's vlog. I'm going to be reading from the authors who have blurbed my favorite books. First thing we have to do is figure out who those authors even are. Welcome back to my kitchen office. I have to change it from September to October. Grandma's homemade fig jam. That's got to be my least favorite of this calendar so far. No offense, Grandma. Let's back up to March of this year. I did this video called Who Has Blurbed My Favorite Books? And I went and I looked at every book that I've given four and a half or five stars and I looked at who had blurbed them, what authors gave their endorsement. I did a spreadsheet to keep track of them all and then in May I did a follow-up video where I read some more books on my TBR that the authors who had blurbed my favorite books had also blurbed. It is now October and we're going to do a part two where I'm reading those authors, the authors who have blurbed the stuff, the authors that I have never read from, but since they love the same books that I love, maybe I will also love their books. First things first, we need to pull up the spreadsheet and update it because I have a basket full of books that I've also given high ratings this year that fit into the weird fantastical or horror or fantasy genres. Since I haven't updated the spreadsheet since May, I can now add these ones in. But here's how the spreadsheet looks at this point. So I have Alexi Harrow, who's blurbed six of my favorite books, Paul Tremblay and Jenny Gornacek, who blurbed five, a couple that have blurbed four, a bunch that have blurbed three. I want to have a five book TBR by the end of this. And I've already read from Alexi Harrow, Paul Tremblay, Stephen Graham Jones, Andy Davidson, Rebecca Roanhorse, Sarah Gailey, V.E. Schwab. Now we're here to see if any of these authors have blurbed these ones as well, if they can move up in the ranks, if they're going to replace each other. I'm going to read the authors who have blurbed the most. And then from there, if there's a whole bunch I can choose from in the same category, I'll just choose whatever I'm interested in. I am going to put those authors back in there though because I have a feeling they might show up. We've got Richard Cadry moving from one to two. I'll fix all the colors later. And then Sarah Gailey moving from three to four. We've got Leech. Oh goodness. Cassandra Ka Brom. I don't think I've ever seen a blurb from Brom. Today Thompson. Apparently he's not on here yet. Oh, Tamsin Moore on the front. Moving along to The Haunting of Alejandra. Gabino Glacius. Clay McLeod Chapman. Then we've got The God of Endings, which is a four but I do have good feelings about it. Laura Moriarty and Lily Brooks Dalton, who I don't think are on here. Immortal Longings, we have Rebecca Roanhorse. And finally, Babel. S.A. Tracker Bordy is moving into the top slot, as is Rebecca Roanhorse. Fang Shepard moving up. Alexis Henderson is making moves. Now let me just make sure there's not any more that I don't have physical copies, but that are on my Goodreads. Okay, I believe the only one that I don't own is An Unkindness of Ghosts by River Solomon, which I read as a library book. And looking on Indigo, Lee Child, Victor Laval, and Tanana Reed do have blurbed it. So that moves him up here. So the spreadsheet is officially updated. Again, taking out the authors that I have already read from and don't need to test if I love because most of them I do. We will officially be reading something from Genevieve Gornachek, something from Shannon Chakraborty, Hannah Witten, and Victor Laval, and then I get to choose one of these authors, Alexandra Kleeman, Charlene Harris, Kate Elliott, or Laura Vanderberg. I already have quite a few of them on my TBR shelf, but as soon as I figure out everything that I'm reading and I've gathered it all, I will check in with you. All right, I've got the goods. I already owned The Ballad of Black Tom, short novella, easy read. The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornachek. I've been excited about for a while. I bought it a couple months ago. It is similar to Circe. I've got the Shannon Track Rebordi. This is a piratey story, The Adventures of Amina Al Serafi. No idea how this is going to go for me. Hannah Witten is probably the one that I'm least confident about, so I picked up two things uh, for the wolf and the fox glove king. I'll be honest, I thought Hannah Witten, I've always thought Hannah Witten was a YA author. I think it's just because all of the other Red Riding Hood retellings that I've seen were YA. I've never read one before. It's longer than I thought. Same with this one. I have no idea what this one is, but we'll read the first chapter of both and see how they go. I picked up Alexandra Kleeman a couple months ago. I love the cover. I found it on sale. I'm not confident about this one because I think it does have to do with celebrity culture, but I do think that this one's going to be more horror than fantasy and a lot of the other things I'm picking up are fantasy. And then I decided on Laura Vanderberg. These two things have been recommended to me directly. I've seen them around in various places. I could have sworn I owned the third hotel, but I can't find it anywhere and I don't see it in any book haul, but I swear I own this. But you know who also owned it? The library. So I just picked it up there. No idea what it's about. This one, I hold a wolf by the ears I bought and on sale and uh, it's a short story collection. So I don't know which I'm going to be in the mood for, but we'll figure it out. And I'll talk to you once I've made my first decision of what book I want to read. 
Hello, good morning. It's our favorite time of day again. Uh, damp 5 a.m. for hockey practice. I'm staying today because immediately after, Liam is getting on a bus to go camping with his class for a couple days. So we just need to whip home as soon as possible afterwards. He has no time to hang out. I'm starting with The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornachek. Ah! Oh my God. <laughs> this is a book that people have told me because I like Circe, I will like. I don't know very much about mythology in general. So I remember that we've got Angerboda and Odin and Loki whoever they are. A banished witch falls in love with the legendary trickster Loki. She risks the wrath of the, it's too early. She risks the wrath of the gods in this moving subversive debut novel that reimagines Norse mythology. So I guess it doesn't really matter if I don't know the mythology because she's gonna be reimagining it anyway. Anyway, I'm gonna sit in there and watch practice, but really just be reading the entire time. And we'll see how far I get in. How far in I get. How far I get in. How far in I get. Bye. Check it out. The sun came out. It's going to be a beautiful day. I made some significant progress in this. We're talking a quarter to a third of the way in and I like it so far. What's actually unexpectedly fun about reading this is since I have no knowledge of Loki, the character from mythology, um, I'm going into it knowing nothing about him except for what we are learning as Angraboda gets involved with him. And therefore, I'm in the same boat as her. We only know Loki as the man who is fathering her children and the person, the fun guy who's in her life. And he disappears a lot and he has like another family and people have all of these rumors about him, like he's doing all this other stuff other places. But we're only hearing those things vaguely from other people. While when we spend time with Loki, He's like as good of a guy as he can be in this situation. When he's there, he's like warm and loving and he's hanging out with his kids, even though we don't know his real motives for anything. And these kids are weird. They have some odd afflictions, probably because they're being fathered by Loki, who has some weird characteristics of his own, like shape-shifting. So he's just popping in and out of their lives occasionally. And Angerboda has this one friend who doesn't, like she's keeping the identity of the father of her children from the people that she knows, especially this one friend who clearly hates Loki. And so she doesn't want her friend knowing that that is who she's involved with. And now that she's had all of her children, I think the plot's really gonna kick off and she's gonna have to decide if her creature children are what she wants for the future or if she's gonna, I don't know. I think she, maybe she gets her magical powers. I'm just realizing her hair actually is her children. Now that, um, I actually understand what the story is. The cover is even more beautiful now. Okay, I'm gonna continue this. Hello, don't mind all of this. And don't mind that I finished the book before checking in with you again. I was just cleaning. It's like fruit fly season and it's worse than it's ever been. And I'm just like constantly scrubbing surfaces, trying to get rid of whatever they want from me. I can't keep up, it's driving me crazy. I'm hot, but of course I'm in a sweater. That was really just for the continuity. I wasn't wearing this to clean, but I popped back on so like you know it's the same day. As if you care, as if I can't tell you that I'm wearing a different outfit later in the day. What's wrong with me? We'll never figure it out. Okay, so first, let me just throw my rating out there. It's a four. Before I get into what I thought of it, I think it's really interesting that the four things that I read from Genevieve Vornicek, and maybe this isn't interesting because the things that she get, gets asked to blurb are retellings because she wrote a retelling. But I do think that it's fun that all of these are retellings. Retellings that I loved because I don't always love a retold story. And they really center women and them finding their power. And that's also what the witch's heart did. So not only do I think that this was the perfect person to blur because the stories are similar genre wise, but also Thematically, they seem so similar. And what all of these have in common, as well as The Witch's Heart, is something that I've learned about myself is a retelling of an ancient myth, um, religious story, real historical event, um, retelling of like a literary classic. A retelling is never gonna make me independently wanna go back and read the origin story, no matter how much I like it. And I don't know what that says about me, but I feel the same with this. Like I have no desire to go actually learn about Angerboda. I saw in one Goodreads review that this woman 
um, was barely in the original myth and it's about her children. So she's known as the mother of monsters. And so we, I guess people who know a lot about mythology know about all of the monsters and the things that they did to the world and the gods. Um, but in here, we're experiencing this woman's story who doesn't really get her own narrative. And that's what's cool about it. I wouldn't have known that. This is literally the first time I've ever seen the word Ragnarok in print other than this title. And if I told my husband that I now know what Ragnarok even means, he would think that I was gonna watch this. So nobody tell him, cause I've never seen a Marvel movie, never gonna see a Marvel movie. I liked how slice of life it felt, especially the part that I reviewed at the beginning, where it was just this woman, that kind of led into a good portion of the book, maybe two thirds of it was just her growing this family and making decisions and finding her power. And then it got like, chaotic and more stuff happened. But I do wish it was even more slice of life, which is probably an unpopular opinion. I kind of wish it was more of a real romance because I got to like Loki and I wanted more like fun banter between the two and like jokes and fun stuff because this felt compared to other um, mythology retellings, it did feel more like current day modern language than anything that I've read before. So because of that, I think I could have enjoyed it if it did feel just like super contemporary. <laughs> and I just wanted more of them, even though the point of the story was her finding her purpose and whatnot. There were a lot of similar themes to Cersei, which is why I know people have recommended this to me. There was just a fruit fly. Did you see it in front of my face? I just cleaned out the trash can, like scrubbed it. And then a couple of them went flying and now they're everywhere instead of just in one area that I can try to kill them all at once. Oh, it had a lot of similarities to Cersei, but it didn't have that real oomph to it. Um, Cersei made me tear up, made me feel so like deeply the things that she was saying about birth and her children it just felt really powerful and this didn't have that same impact for me it was more an appreciation for the story that she was telling rather than me feeling deeply connected to it oh and none of you bitches told me when you recommend this to me that it's queer like it's sapphic and I don't know if that's canon. Let's move on. I have so much time. My child is gone for three days. And even though he would currently still be in school right now if he was home, I just feel like I have this sense of freedom. Like I could do anything. So what am I gonna do? Read another book. This, interestingly, The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval is also a retelling of sorts. I guess it's this H.P. Lovecraft classic story where, um, the focus of the story, the main character, side characters, something isn't like done well or is problematic, racist. And so this author decided to take it and feature a character who didn't get, I guess, the focus that they, that he thought that character should get. And so he wrote his own novella. I did read the first chapter of this in the reading the first chapter of every book on my TBR video. I can't remember what I gave it. I want to say it was an eight or a nine, but I don't remember how it kicked off. I need to start it again. I am debating, should I read the classic? How long is it? It's called The Horror at Red Hook. And I know that people will tell me because you've already told me that I will get more from this if I read that first. But again, it's hard to convince me to read the origin story of something just to experience something else. But I'll let you know what I decide later. And you can't be mad at me. Okay, that's our agreement. Whatever I decide, next clip, you've, you gotta be cool with the decision I made. Okay, you may be happy to know, I did indeed decide, this doesn't look like anything. Uh, this is the audiobook that I found of the horror at Red Rock on YouTube. That's really the only reason I decided to go ahead and read it is because it was readily available. And it's not exactly what I was expecting. I think I assumed there would be a specific character who was treated unfairly who deserved this moment of retribution and Victor Laval wanted to take that on. But as I was reading, I didn't really recognize any specific character that I feel like would fit the bill for that. It was more just a general kind of vibe. And I think to fully grasp what was wrong with the book is to understand um, H.P. Lovecraft's racist and xenophobic views and that he isn't just putting characters in his books that feel a certain way, that it's him himself who is inserting his opinions and perspectives onto his stories. I haven't read anything else from this author. I never planned to. I really don't know too much about him, but I'm assuming that's the kind of vibe. 
Um, so there is this general xenophobic attitude in the entire book from it's from the detective who's the main character's perspective. This is such a short book. It's a short story included in some different anthologies, but um, I did see you could buy it as a standalone novella. I don't know how many pages it was, but it was an hour long audiobook. And there's just this detective who is saying all of these things about um, immigrants and pretty much every person of color or when he's referring to groups of people, he refers to them as like creatures. But then we do have this narrator who isn't a character of his own. So it very much feels like the author agreeing with what the detective is thinking and saying things like all of the immigrants in this part of town, uh, some of them are turned away at the border, rightfully so. When the detective is walking around and encountering language he doesn't recognize, uh, the narrator is like, well, obviously they're doing devil worship. And that is proven to be correct, sorry for the spoilers, but there is an underground cult and it is all of the people who've emigrated to the United States. Overall, it's just like not a very good story. Uh, not a lot happened in it. It was just this, this detective being like, oh, all of these people are probably, they probably have a cult. And then he was like, oh, look, there's a cult. I was right, it's a cult. I appreciated some of the phrasing and some of the writing, but it was a pretty like uninteresting story overall. I don't feel like rating it. It didn't feel like a complete story. And now I'm getting into this one. It's actually been two days since I've seen you. Liam's coming back today. So maybe I can finish this before I go grab him yesterday. I was just, what was I doing? I don't know, basking in the child free life. But then by evening, Rob and I got really bored and we were like, what is life gonna be like when he's old enough to like not live with us anymore? Like, what are we gonna do when we're empty nesters at like 38 years old? And that's when I decided I needed to find a new hobby by that point in my life. And I have committed to um, getting my pilot's license. So that's what happens when Liam goes out of town for three days is I decide I'm gonna become a pilot. Anyway, we had a great ramen dinner. I took my grandma to a doctor's appointment I didn't read anything. So now I'm gonna get through this. I reread the first chapter. I'm a little bit into it now. And the vibe is just generally um, a similar idea, but our main characters are far more aware. So the detective, I think it was the detective, said something like, um, oh, I look at the immigrants and I think this. And then I think to myself, am I judging them too harshly? Am I placing my assumptions upon them? And just giving a very clear contrast and intention um, to the characters who obviously he did not appreciate the way they were written in the original. And I still don't know like what the plot is actually gonna be because it can't just be him discovering this cult, but I'll come back to you with my review. I've had my hair in a bun for the last like three hours since I saw you last. And I was just gonna start getting ready for bed and take off my makeup and I realized I did not update you. When I finished this pretty soon after I talked to you, it was a very quick read. And I'm gonna rate it the same as the first book that I read for the video, so another four. I think he did a really great job at adding some more vivid imagery to the whole setting and being in New York in the 20s, which is weird to think that was a hundred years ago. <laughs> you really got a feel for the city and everything that was going on. Our main characters were Tom, like the people we knew from the original story, but then we had Tom and his father and how they were struggling, how they were persevering, how they were being manipulated by various people. There's this occult magic going on that's explored. And I really liked the explanation of it all, the reasoning behind it, who was actually responsible. I think it made a lot of sense. I think it was very intentional. There was also this added, I mean, naturally, revenge plot because the book itself clearly is a response in both an appreciation way um, and also a critique. And so it having a revenge angle just makes a lot of sense. I'm really happy to have read it. I will pick up more from this author for sure. And there was like one specific uh, scene that I didn't like but also loved because um, it had to do with eyeballs. Um, eyelids and the quote that went along with it was just the perfect and it was just the perfect amount of horror like it wasn't too descriptive but it was a little bit icky and just this general cosmic horror kind of frightening vibe but more so frightening for the people involved I don't really have any gripes about it like I don't know if I have a great reason why it's a four and not a five but I appreciate it a lot for what it is so um, I'll see you tomorrow when I start my next read. Hello, my friends. I don't like filming when I don't have anything on my face. However, if I don't update you today, I might not be talking to you until I'm finished 
this so I need to give you an update I need to vlog today even though I feel terrible I woke up yesterday with a cold I didn't read anything um, I had a live show for my book club um, on Strulio. it went really well I love the book and I was just feeling under the weather so I skipped hockey and then I took a bath and I got out of the bath and like I pulled something in my back I'm in so much pain and I cannot be dealing with either of these things right now because I have a photo shoot this week um and I also needed to go like get my nails done so like go sit in a chair for an hour or whatever anyway let me update you on this I'm one third of the way in because I'm not doing anything with my day except lying here and reading this book so The Adventures of Amina Al Serafi is kind of giving me the vibes of Legends and Lattes where just the description of this woman who I don't even remember how old but like you know a little older than your typical um protagonist at least that I have read in fantasy and she is bigger than most people like she's tall and she's broad and she's very powerful and very intimidating and then um she finds like a peaceful life to live. So in Legends and Lattes, uh, she starts like a coffee shop. And after all of her big adventures and everyone being scared of her, she just wants a simple, peaceful life. And that feels like what Amina has been through as well. She used to be this notorious pirate. People were terrified of her. She took so many people out, took all these jobs, was incredible. And now she's been living this peaceful life. She had a daughter and they're living, um, but pretty privately. And at this point, she's now getting back into like the pirate life because somebody comes and um, asks her to find their missing granddaughter. And it happens to be the child of one of her old crewmates. And there's like something going on with them. I don't know, like what kind of friendship or relationship, or maybe she's responsible for that person's current life situation like I don't know what the dynamics are that obviously we're gonna learn about and is the point but now she's leaving her daughter behind and going on like one more adventure so that's where I'm at with it she has learned certain things I guess and what the synopsis says is that things become alarmingly clear there's more to this job and the girl's disappearance than she was led to believe so that's just now happening and she's starting to question everything I guess as she's been told let me check in with you probably at another third of the way in Hey, me again. I actually made it farther than the second, third, um, but I don't think my brain is fully here. So I'm gonna update you when I officially finish it in just a minute tomorrow. But right now we are just in the adventure. Like she's on a ship, she has this crew, she's trying to figure everything out. And what I didn't mention also is something really fun about this is there's like a narrator and clearly you know that Amina is telling this story after the fact once everything's over so you know that everything kind of turns out okay. And she is penning her story and there's like this scribe who is taking notes and telling the story alongside her. And so occasionally it'll stop. I know people were saying this about the audiobook that um, there's another narrator who pops in and talks once in a while, which is a fun element because it's just like a little back and forth. Like, are you sure you want me to say this part in the story? And the scribe is talking to her about like how to be a proper storyteller. And it's just really fun. And the creatures have come into it and the cover feels appropriate. So I'm having a good time and I'll give you my final rating in the morning. It feels like a four. Okay, I do not feel any better or look any better quite yet. I finished this though and I have absolutely nothing but positive things to say about it. It is a four. Amina has a lot of family drama with her ex-partner. Um, she obviously has this daughter and I think, I imagine she will become more of the story in subsequent books. Uh, the way that this goes and what Amina needs to accomplish because basically she's making all of these different deals with people and agreements with people to accomplish her own goal. And so I imagine this being a five book series, seeing that she has to accomplish five things. And I think that'll be really fun. I hope that we get a romantic uh, relationship to follow. I just really hope that it has a little bit of 
I don't know if like steam is what I'm looking for but I want there to be something because there is some fun banter and five books would leave like so many different opportunities like if you're thinking five seasons of a show um, your main character could be in multiple relationships so I'm not it's not so much that I'm rooting for one in particular I just think that would be fun to follow and would also add some more mature adult themes because I know some people are saying this is YA um, because it's like lighter fantasy and I think it's so important that there is lighter fantasy for adults. There are definitely bad things happening like it's a pirate story you have to take there are creatures like it's difficult circumstances but it's lighter as in the way that the story is being told the stakes don't feel too high. There's a little bit of silly goofiness in it. Um, I laughed out loud probably three times spe specifically when she was interacting with this one character and then the ending and a couple like not so much a reveal but just an explanation behind a certain storytelling element just made so much sense and I thought it was perfect. There was there was a lot of like feminist conversations in here, gender conversations in here, but not so much that that felt like the point of the story. It was just her adventure. It's hard for me to commit to a series um, so I think I would wait to see if the second book people love and then I might commit to the whole thing because I am interested in what's going on in here and the world building that we had. There was definitely a lot to learn in like the final third. Um, Amina is coming into contact with different magical situations that she is unfamiliar with so she has a lot to learn from people and therefore we get to understand everything. Um, yeah I thought it was good. I would recommend it. So that's that on that. Today I'm reading a short story collection. The boys are just out grocery shopping and they're going to play baseball and it's like a holiday so I don't really have a lot going on today and I'm reading I Hold a Wolf by the Ears by Laura Vanderberg author of The Third Hotel. I'm already considering checking out The Third Hotel because I'm not loving this. I'm five stories in and I think when people recommend me short story collections I probably assume that they're gonna be weird and horror and fantasy and especially with her blurb and the other things that's just what I imagine. None of them well one of them has been uh, lightly fantastical but they're all just really mundane at this point in real life. The first one was about a group of girls in prison. One of them was just getting out. The second one was about this like complex motel apartment building um, just full of weird people. I gave both of those a three. I gave the next one a three which is about a woman and her daughter was dying of cancer. The number one theme of this is death. There has been death in every single story. The fifth story was about this controlling marriage. It got a little bit odd but then it just ended which was so sad and unsatisfying. I did give it a four for the concept though. The sixth story called The Pitch was my first five star in here. It was very good. Um, it was about this couple and her seeing something in a photograph from his childhood and not believing or not or wanting to fully understand like what happened in his youth. So we'll see if they get weirder as we go because right now that is how it was. The first ones were very realistic and the last the latter ones that I just read um, were still realistic but they had this ominous kind of vibe to it but none of them have completely knocked my socks off even when I gave a five I just thought maybe it was just impressive compared to the others. I'm reading this very quickly so I'll come back to you with my rating soon and then probably move on to her other book at least read the first couple chapters and see if it's more in line with what I'm looking for or if this turns out to be that I'll see you soon. It's a new day and I thought if I decided to look a little better today then I would feel better. I don't. I have now in fact rescheduled my shoot which I'm so sad about but it's fine. I also have to accept that this vlog is going to be far less interesting and like real life um, content and it's just about the books. So let me tell you the journey that I've been on since I saw you last like 24 hours ago. I finished I Hold a Wolf by the Ears. I'm giving it three stars. I gave the next couple ones four stars three stars. Do I need to show you each one? <laughs> three stars, four stars, and three stars. They were just okay. I don't even really remember what I told you about the other ones and how these ones are different or the same. Um, still a lot of death themes. There were some friendship themes like getting in contact with old friends. There was some weird stuff but not weird enough. I don't know this just didn't really stand out to me in any way and so I was thinking let me like try the first chapter of The Third Hotel and it was not doing it for me. So I don't know, maybe Laura Vanderberg is not the author for me. It opened with meeting this woman who was going to a, a film festival. He's dead, but now she sees him like following her around or like an apparition. 
it just didn't do anything for me. Um, I also read the first chapter of Something New Under the Sun and I it didn't do anything for me. Maybe at another time I would grab the audiobook, but it was like a long 30 page first chapter. I think the conversations and the things that this book wants to talk about is definitely worth reading. Maybe I just need something a little more fun in this current state, but it had to do with um, this man and there was an adaptation of his movie being made and there's like droughts and wildfires. And this company who's making synthetic water and maybe they are the reason why everything is falling apart. And it's about like um, corporate corruption. Anyway, then I read the first chapter of For the Wolf and I didn't really like it. Also, I thought it was a Red Riding Hood retelling. It's a Beauty and the Beast retelling, or at least inspired by that. It's about this girl being sacrificed to a wolf, but it turns out the wolf is actually a man, not a monster. And I guess if they fall in love, they will break the curse or something. Okay, so I still need to read a fifth book for the video to complete everything. And Hannah Witten like needs to be the one. She was at the top of the spreadsheet um, or near the top, whatever. So I started the Foxglove King and it did more for me than this one for sure. Right now it feels very much for the youth. Um, and it's reminding me of like one for my enemy and oh dance of thieves by mary e pearson so we have this girl named lore spelled like l-o-r-e lore and she's involved in various like scams and drug dealings and she gets recruited um to like infiltrate this kingdom to get close to the sun prince so that's the point that I'm at. She's like just meeting him, just getting introduced. And I wonder if, like it kind of feels like there's gonna be a love triangle in here. I don't know. Which also feels a little youthful, I'm not gonna lie. She's basically a spy and that's not always my favorite thing to read. Um, but she's like pretending to be a relative of this guy and that's how they get into like the society that she needs to. And there's this magic um, that has to do with necromancy and it can be really deadly and there's drugs and that's the vibe. I'll update you in a little bit and let you know how everything is going. All right, it's 9 p.m. Rob brought me home from work some um, Dayquil, so I'm feeling a little bit better. Uh, they're currently playing NHL right behind the door, so sorry if that is loud. I've made it to chapter 30. I'm definitely struggling through this. I'm trying not to DNF. Um, and like, I already know that there's gonna be people who are gonna say that I should have powered through for the wolf. And I'm gonna have this regret at the end because this is definitely not anything above a three. I feel like the last, I feel like the last hundred pages I read was so pointless and boring and I just don't care about any of it. And I still have a hundred pages to go, which feels daunting. I think the world build, like, listen, I don't read a ton of fantasy. I do like a lot of the fantasy that I read, but I don't think I have a really great grasp on what is good world building versus bad world building and good magic systems and all of that. I just say words and I think, I say what they mean to me and I don't know if I'm ever right. And obviously it's all subjective, but I think that the magic system is interesting. It makes sense, I think. The idea of mortem and bringing people back to life. Um, our main character has this ability. It's like, it's kind of an illegal ability too. And she is being brought into here as a spy. But beyond her skill of like bringing people or doing the necromancy stuff, I don't understand why she would even have been selected for this position. Like, yeah, she has some background in certain things, but I wouldn't say she's an objectively good spy and that has been proven to us throughout the pages where she really lacks the ability to get the information that she needs. I think it's interesting how the magic works and how um, there are people trying to control it. The reason that she is gonna be a spy and is trying to figure out what's up with this prince is because he is being accused of illegally doing this magic and killing people. And so she has a romantic connection between him. I don't feel like that's a spoiler. I don't even know if it's in the synopsis. Well, it calls him arrogant and handsome. So I think that gives it to you right there. And then she also has this little thing with 
her guard. And this just feels like such a traditional like YA fantasy, the chosen one trope with the girl from a secret, you know, not great upbringing who has medium length auburn hair and she's like a little quirky but like really headstrong but is falling for two guys at the same time and they're fighting over her that's not actually fair i don't know that they're fighting over her maybe that'll become more so a thing in the trilogy um we're just getting to know their personalities and i i don't really see why any of them like each other besides like the flirtatious banter that we get to see i don't feel like we have earned any of these romantic connections. Even like the hate to love dynamic all feels so rooted in rumors and miscommunication that I don't think we've earned the hate nor the hate to love. And at this point there's a reason why they haven't been able to go anywhere and they're kind of all stuck in an environment together which should be fun to read but instead it was just really exhausting and quite dull and I wonder what's gonna happen in these last hundred pages. Hopefully it gets steamy like honestly that's all I'm hoping for at this point. Maybe it'll be polyamorous. I just need something to happen that makes me feel like worth the adult categorization and therefore the $37 price tag. Before I finish it I'm gonna show you a little package, actually two packages um, that I got today and they're the same book. So I opened this package upside down by accident, um, but I got my book of the month. I don't do book of the month very often, but I have unfortunately racked up credits because I keep forgetting to pause it. I got some credits when I got um, my mom the subscription and hers has now expired because I got her six months instead of a year by accident. Um, but the good thing about that is I'm gonna renew her subscription and gift her Starling House, which I don't know that she'll love or that I'll love, but I thought we could kind of buddy read it together because I realized that I was supposed to read this for this video. Um, when I initially made the spreadsheet, I talked about the fact that all of the authors in the three, four, five, and six um, book who've blurbed six, whatever you don't get what I'm saying, um, they're all authors that I have enjoyed. The ones that I've read from, I've enjoyed all of them except for one and that's Alexi e. Harrow and everyone was telling me I need to try one more time and so I was thinking about doing that for this video and then I completely forgot about it and the video <laughs> the video is about to be done and that's fine but I can fit this into another video next month and the proof that I was planning on doing that is because I also ordered it from Indigo and they both arrived today <laughs> and I forgot I forgot that I had ordered this so um I placed my book of the month order the thing with book of the month is you have to like order one of the books of the month in order to order anything else so there was a couple that I'd had my eye on from previous months but I was never interested enough in like the main titles I guess or I thought maybe I could get them from the library um so I passed on happiness falls but then when this popped up I was like okay I can order the book of the month and then I can add something on. And this is one that I haven't gotten from the library yet. This came out in August, but I also wanna read this for a video in November. So I thought I would just order this. And then also how to say Babylon, because this is just a memoir that sounds interesting. I really like the cover. And so I just ordered it. And then the other thing that came from Indigo is this, which I didn't actually realize was a hardcover. And it has like a texture on it. It's out there screaming the anthology of New Black Horror edited by Jordan Peele and um, I haven't officially announced this anywhere. I've loosely announced it um, but it is going to be a Literally Dead Book Club pick in 2024. So I am absolutely itching to get to this. It's hurting me that other people are reading it and posting all about it and I want to be in on it but I also think it would be so fun to do an anthology for the first time in the Literally Dead Book Club because I love a short story collection. Ooh, and here's the bookmark that came with Book of the Month. So with that little book haul intermission, I'm going to read the final 100 pages of this. <laughs> That was really a nothing montage, hey? I totally forgot to turn the camera on <laughs> after that first clip. Honestly, I feel like everything in this video feels correct. My, you watched my health decline and my reads decline and the quality of the content decline. It all was serendipitous. I genuinely don't have much more to say about this. This is the kind of fantasy that I would compare to the other two I already mentioned. As far as I will never think about these books again, I'm gonna forget every single character's name in six months. It's just gonna blur together as this group of like 
fantasy reads parts of series that I tried to read one time. I didn't like the ending. Um, I see how it can be set up for a series, but it was like too anticlimactic. And I appreciate everybody who loves this. And I, I read blurbs so much more often now that I've started doing this. And um, I'm very happy for Ava Reed and Ali Hazelwood. Katie Robert, Erin E. Craig, some of those make more sense than the others, for loving this and endorsing it, and that's great. I'm giving it a 2.5. I also read I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, which I gave a 3. The Adventures of Amina El Sarafi, yeah, which I gave a 4. Ballad of Black Tom, which I gave a 4. And we kicked it off with The Witch's Heart, which I gave a 4. So these are five authors who have blurbed so many of my favorite books that it was just due time to finally experience them to see if they could now become favorites. For some of them, I do see a future in which I read more. I know that both of these authors in particular have other things I'm, I would be interested in. Um, and this series is something that I will probably continue. It was definitely valuable to do this. I didn't leave with a five star, but that's okay. I think in my other blurb video, I also didn't leave with a five star. However, a four is high enough to be added to the spreadsheet. So the people who blurbed Shannon Chakraborty's book, I can add Wesley Chu, R.F. Kuang, and Fonda Lee to the spreadsheet or bump them up. And then for The Witch's Heart, we had Margaret George, Samantha Shannon, and Tom Shippey, who I don't think are on the spreadsheet, but they are now. And online, I didn't see a single blurb for The Ballad of Black Tom. There wasn't an editorial review and the back is the same, so. That's okay. I might actually read another Victor Laval next month, but we'll see. I have a Goodreads video in the works. If you want to join my channel membership, uh, there is going to be a live Goodreads Choice Awards reaction happening on the day that it comes out, whenever that is. But it'll be about a month from now, so now's a great time to join. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, let me know if you want me to do anything else blurb related, and I'll see you later. Bye!